So welcome to ACLS 2021. Wait, hold on, hold on. Not you, my side business. <laughs> wait, wait, is that real money? He also didn't say he was going to give you the money. He just showed you. I just showed you the money. <laughs> Don't read into it. <laughs> Don't read into it. Don't read into it. Okay, guys, welcome. Thank you very much. I'll make it as painless as possible. <clears throat> uh, course overview. All this slide says is that everything AHA has and presents to us is all evidence-based. They do studies, long-term studies, double blind, uh, placebo, all that stuff. They follow crews in the field, in the hospital, and they present their findings. It's all evidence-based. Nothing's uh, 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 hypothetical or, or hypothesized, I should say. Uh, what we're going to learn is the systematic approach to uh, ACLS and BLS. They are harping big time, big time, big time on compressions, 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 right? Uh, they're calling it high chest compression fraction or CCF. You might see that somewhere, right? They're harping on it. They want you to minimize the amount of time that you spend off the chest where Laura can you get me the mannequin if you if, please thank you so much uh, minimize interruptions at all costs is what they're harping on now so high chest compression fraction CCF right uh, high quality BLS again airway management with the advent of the eye gel did I tell you guys a story on how the eye gel came to be so Steve Jobs when he found out he had throat cancer he knew he was going to be having a lot of procedures the iPhone the eye gel I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Sounds good, all right? <laughs> Come on, that's all I get? Oh, man. Is that recording? Yeah. <laughs> it won't hear you because my mic's here. It's not over there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go over rhythm recognition, how to go over the rhythms. There's 14 different rhythms that they need you to recognize and if needed, mitigate how to treat them. We're going to do the unstable, stable thing and uh, we'll go through it as we go through each rhythm. So when we get to the mega code, it's going to be a lot easier and shorter, hopefully. Right. Cardioversion, pacing uh, and meds. Uh, Laura's going to go over that really, really well. There are some changes from AHA guidelines to our protocols, which you guys saw in the pretest. Atropine being one of them, right? And epinephrine being the other one. We'll talk about that. Skills, just they want you to recognize immediate uh, respiratory and cardiopulmonary emergencies. That's all this slide talks about. How to improve outcomes, right? To recognize it quicker and to have uh, uh, more rapid uh, higher uh, interventions. That's all it talks about. BLS, 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 right? Pump, pump, pump. Doesn't matter. We'll show you, I'll show you some things that they want you to start doing in the field now to decrease the amount of compression fraction. Uh, a little bit of the history. There's a bunch of it. Uh, the big one I'm just going to tell you is right here, Claude Beck, he's a pediatric surgeon, 1947, who's doing surgery in some pediatric little boy. He fibrillated on the table. Uh, he says, hey nurse, go get that thing down in the basement, wipe the dust off of it, right? It was basically two wires attached to wood and it was open heart defibrillation. They defibrillated him, got him back. He's like, hmm, we might have something here, right? And they started the studies on it. Where's the big one? Right here. No, no, no. 1979, ACLS was officially uh, 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 brought together or uh, brought as a committee and recognized. Ninth, where's the one I'm looking for here? Because homeboy is going to ask you about it. 19... We're here, 1956, Paul Zoll, um, he was a cardiologist. He used to do a lot of studies on dogs, shocking them, uh, bringing them into V-fib, shocking them again, bringing them out of V-fib. And he was the one who first developed the idea of closed chest defibrillation before it was all open chest. He figured out, oh, let's try this and put paddles on and increase the jewels and it worked. So when you guys talk to the Zoll guy today and he gets to that portion, to really upset him, go, oh yeah, Paul Zoll, 1956. He'll be like, right, if you remember that. Uh, nothing here. So like I said earlier, high chest compression fraction is what they're harping on. The HA is putting emphasis on BLS, 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 right? Uh, do compressions, 
Um, uh, let's give so, uh, advanced airway medications and back to compressions. Let's minimize the amount of stops that we do. The ROC trials or ROC consortium, the Resuscitation Outcome Consortium did a study and they found that an 11% in high compression fractions increased outcomes for out of hospital to 10%. Some of those things include when we're checking for a pulse check, right? When we'd get done with our two minutes and the monitor says charging, select energy, don't, you know, don't touch the patient. So now we're doing CBR and it says charging, select energy uh, uh, joules, right? We keep doing CPR while they're selecting the energy until the charge light comes on. When we're done, we used to do this, right? Now we do this, just hover, shock, and immediately go back to it to minimize interruptions and keep that inter interthoracic pressure up. The very first compression you stop doing CPR, that interthoracic pressure drops dramatically and it takes a while for it to come back up and bring blood to the heart, lung and brains where it needs to, right? On a good day, on a good day, we're moving 35% volume of the, of the body where it needs to. That's like cowboy, I'm looking at the puck, it's filling up and no, you know, I'm allowing for recoil, 120 beats per minute and I'm doing awesome. 35% total blood volume, right, if they're lucky if they're lucky and switching compressors every two minutes even if you feel you can do it even if you feel you can do it switch because when those next two minutes come up you're going to start to get tired and then your form goes away and then if you guys paid attention on the zoles when we're doing cpr it has a metronome have you guys paid attention to that well they're saying now if your equipment doesn't have one to download one, so I have it, place it by the patient. How fast is that? AHA, BLS. 120. 120 beats per minute, right? So now I don't have to think about anything. I just listen to the metronome, find my happy place. What are we gonna eat for lunch? I'm pretty hungry. This guy's looking good. Uh, put the agile, give me a line, right? But in the meantime, we're just listening to the metronome and getting it done. There's a dozen of these things online. Pick whichever one you want. So the heart, it's very uh, uh, specific, specialized tissue. It has five characteristics that no other part of the, mu of the uh, muscles in the body has. And those things, I highlighted two of them because two of the drugs that we use specifically work on those portions of the heart. The heart has its own automaticity, right? The ability to spontaneously generate an electrical impulse on its own. Even if I take it out of the body, put it on a Petri dish, it'll still beat on its own. It can do that. It's an amazing piece of, uh, uh, of ingenuity, right? Conductivity allows for transmission of electrical impulses from cell to cell. When we get into uh, the sodium potassium pump, actin myosin, uh, trans the signals transmit from one to another to spontaneously depolarize all at once and then repolarize. Contractility refers to the ability for uh, uh, electrical pulses to be received, rhythmicity, nice and even, and excitability, the ability to receive an electrical impulse. Two drugs we have, one was brought back into the algorithm for AHA. We don't use it in our uh, and Lee County protocols, but it is in the AHA algorithm. <clears throat> so the first one, we've used it for a long time. It's been, uh, uh, it's continued to be in the algorithm is amniodarone. Amniodarone directly affects sodium, potassium, and calcium channels. Very, very important. It lowers the excitability and decreases the heart's ability to respond to uh, unwanted signals. Uh, we all know the SA node, AV node, bundle of his, Purkinje fibers, right? Electrical impulse starts up here and then flows nice and evenly, smoothly down the heart, right? One depolarization and repolarization. The analogy I like to use is if I throw a rock into a nice calm body of water, what happens? In one direction, ripples in one direction, right? The SA node coming down, nice easy, right? Now, if I take a handful of rocks, nice calm body of water, throw that in the water, what happens? What happens to the ripples? Everywhere. Everywhere. 
The heart is excited, excitable, because coronary arteries have now clogged. It's ischemic, not getting oxygen. So instead of the Purkinje fibers being the primary firing place, it starts receiving signals from everywhere. Beat, 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 beat. We now have a quivering heart, V-fib. So amniodarone lowers the excitability and decreases the heart's ability to respond to unwanted signals. Amniodarone is classified as what type of drug? Anti -rhythmic. Anti rhythmic, anti dysrhythmic. It is a calcium channel blocker. It's a calcium channel blocker and it stabilizes the heart to uh, not beat at a faster rate. It stabilizes the, the beat of the heart, right? And it blocks the hormones and the actions that speed up the heart. It also lowers the defibrillation threshold so we can use electricity at lower settings more effectively. Monophasic and biphasic monitors. All our monitors now and new monitors coming out are biphasic, which means they're more efficient. They use lower energy settings and we don't have to crank it all the way up to 360 like we used to. Amniodarone at a rate of 100 to 150 joules, 200 joules, is very effective, as effective as 360. We don't have to crank up the electricity like we used to because amniodarone stabilizes the heart, the sodium potassium pump and calcium channels. Lidocaine brought back, been out of the game for a while. We used to use it only primarily for IO injections to numb the site, right? It, uh, aside from numbing the heart, we know that lidocaine numbs the heart, right? Not lidocaine, novocaine, the cane family, directly uh, derived from the cocaine leaves. That's where it all comes from. Uh, it works directly on the Purkinje fibers of the ventricles. So it raises the stimulation threshold. So I really got to stimulate the ventricles to pump, right? So it makes the ventricles less likely to fibrillate. So it increases the V-fib threshold, which makes it more difficult to fibrillate, to, defib to fibrillate, and then I have electricity that's more effective. So those two drugs in combination is, is a win-win effect. And that's why we use lidocaine and amniodarone. Any questions on that? Clear as mud, right? By anatomy of the heart, epicardium, myocardium, endocardium. Myocardium is the functional portion of the heart. Does all the working uh, portions, right? The pumping, we know that. Uh, it's a closed system. Two pumps on top, two pumps on the bottom. Deoxygenated blood comes from the inferior superior vena cava, right atrium, down the tricuspid valve. That valve is controlled uh, by chordae tendinae, attached to papillary muscles that prevent blood from flowing back up, right? Uh, right ventricle out to the lungs, the gas exchange takes place. Back in, pull the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, semilunar valve or mitral valve, left ventricle, and the very, very first place it goes, oxygen-rich blood, is to the heart itself, left and right main coronary artery. It's a genius design. And then out to the aorta, to the rest of the body, starts all over again. It's a genius design. There it is, right? And we see that that left ventricle, obviously, is thicker because it's got to pump blood to my little toe all the way down and then pump it all the way back up. That, oh. Those are the chordae tendinae, right? The tendons that prevent that uh, valve from opening back up. And those are the papillary muscles that it attaches to. When we look at cardiac tissue, it's highly specialized tissue. If you guys take anatomy one and two, you remember, if you want to get all geeked out, it's intercalated mononucleated cells. Who cares? Big word, fancy, right? It's the only type of tissue in the body that looks like that under a slide. Uh, it fits together like a tongue and groove and sends signals to one another to work simultaneously to beat when it needs to all at the same time but it needs ATP from the mitochondria. There's the mitochondria right there. Adenosine triphosphate makes actin and myosin uh, open and close. ATP gets released, myosin attaches to actin, oars on a boat, everybody's, some of you guys have rowed before. When you put the, the oar in the water, you turn it, move the water. When you bring it up, you turn it so you don't hit the water and then over again, right? That's how actin and myosin work at the microscopic level. 
When we die, I think I've told you guys, we don't release ATP anymore. The mitochondria doesn't work. So when that muscle comes out, it can't release and come back. We get a condition called, huh? Rigor, rigor mortis, right? That's why we get stiff because we don't produce ATP anymore and the muscles lock in place. Eventually that goes away and with the body becomes flaccid. So the sodium potassium pump, you guys remember this? Medics, high school, vaguely, right? How it works. This is the cell membrane, biphospholipid layer. Who cares? It just means it's two layers of fat. Lipids are fat. Um, ATP is needed to open this gate right here, right? Uh, we have a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell, higher concentration of potassium inside the cell. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. And they're always trying to move against the gradient. So adenosine triphosphate, three phosphate molecules bind to this gate. Three sodium ions bind onto here. The gate opens the other direction, lets the sodium out extracellular. Now it has a higher affinity for potassium ions. It then binds to here, to the gate again. The, the phosphate molecule releases, now becomes uh, adenosine diphosphate. Potassium comes in the cell. It repeats itself, and this happens like that on a large scale. It's a miracle of science, right? It's awesome, totally awesome. So we get into the conduction system. We look at the pacers of the heart, and we know that the lower we get, the slower the pacemaker. When, we talk, when I talk about the intrinsic rate, intrinsic just means within or the normal part. Intrinsic, the normal. So the intrinsic rate of the SA node, we know is 60 to 100 beats per minute. And these numbers we have to know because when we get to ECG recognition, there's a couple of rules that we have to follow, but we have to know a certain amount of numbers to figure out what rhythm it is we're looking at. The AV node takes over 45, 50, 40 to 50, bundle of his, it comes down, it gets slower and slower until we get to the Purkinje fibers of ventricles at a rate of 20 to 40. Uh, the AV node, rate of 45, let's just say 40 to 50 to keep it simple. Uh, what makes a, um, a junctional rhythm characteristic? How do I know looking at, at a junctional rhythm? Yes. Or, or a narrow complex because remember the node is above the ventricles. The ventricles are down here, so we're still supraventricular above the ventricles, right? So we'll have absence of P waves because the SA node is what generates the P wave. So now we'll have an absence of P waves or inverted P waves. You guys remember, right? At a normal rate, the PRI is normal, one to one conduction, QRS is normal, everything's fine just the absence of P waves and a slower rate. I have all of this stuff. What do we call that junctional rhythm within its limits? You guys remember, it starts with an I. $100 right here. Don't spend it all in one place. Don't take it to the bank. <laughs> most important or take it to the bank it'll be funny <laughs> so idiojunctional rhythm right idiojunctional rhythm that's what we call that now if it is uh 10 beats faster at 60 beats right same laws apply absence of or inverted p waves everything else is normal but now it's just faster by 10 beats what do we now call that rhythm starts with an a oh blanco I can't give two of you guys 100 bucks, but I'll give you guys 20 each. I'll take it. <laughs> there you go. You guys are making out like fiends today. Yes. Making out like fiends. Don't, don't spend it all in one place. Don't tell your wives about it. They'll want it, right? It's special money. Special money. Give it to your kids. There you go. <laughs> so accelerated junctional. Accelerated junctional and idiojunctional. Why I bring that up is because you might see that somewhere later. Right, you might see that somewhere later. The same thing when I get to the ventricles, right? The ventricular rate, 20 to 40. I know it's a ventricular rate because now it's below the AV node. It has no discernible P waves, wide QRS, 
um, no conduction ratio, but the characteristic is it's normal, right? A regular rate, 20 to 40 beats per minute YQRS. What do we call that rhythm? Idio, idioventricular, right? Idioventricular. Now, if this was 10 beats higher, what would we call it? Accelerated ventricular. Now, if it's at a rate of 150, what would we call it? Ventricular tachycardia, right? With or without pulses, we'll go through that. I say that, I bring that up because you might see that somewhere. They use that accelerated and the idio words they bring up. When we talk about the heart and what portions of the heart may cause uh, arrhythmias, it's usually these four areas, they call them arrhythmogenic zones, the SA, the atriums, the AV and the ventricles. It's very, very difficult not to say that it, it's impossible, but those are usually the four portions of the heart that cause a dysrhythmia. How we read ECGs on a paper, all I want you to remember is up and down is electricity, left to right is time, right? From Hashtag from one hashtag to one hashtag is three minute, uh, three seconds. And I want one hashtag, two hashtags, three hashtags. That gives me a six second strip. Well, that's how we interpret or try to interpret a rhythm. So when you're, you can't see what's on the monitor, you hit print, get at least a minimum of a six second strip. And I'll, you'll see that here in a second. How we count our rates. One of the methods is triplets method. This is what I use still today. We find the QRS complex that lands on the first dark line. Here's one right here. The next dark line would coincide with the rate. So if the very next QRS complex was in the very next dark line, that heart rate would be at 300 beats per minute. Good luck. That's not good, right? So each corresponding dark line is another beat. So 300, 150, 175, 50, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. That's how it would go. And then our six second rule, uh, let me back up. You could only use triplets method and the six second method if it's a regular heartbeat. Thank you, Wooly. Right, he reminded me of that yesterday. So what do we do? We get our one, two, three hashtags, six second strip. I count how many QRS complexes are in that six second strip, divide it by 10, I'll multiply it by 10, and that's how I know how many or how fast that rhythm is. This is at a rate of one, two, three, four, five times 10, 50, right? Uh, P waves prolonged, right? Might be uh, 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 above the ventricles. Is this good or bad? Huh? I'm happy with that. <laughs> happy, but remember, we treat the patient, not the monitor. What if it's some guy in shape that does triathlons like Blanco? <laughs> you used to do triathlons. <laughs> this would be a normal rate, right? But you get some guy who comes in, he does has no visual tracking when you walk in, pale, cool, diaphoretic, clenching his chest. Now it's another story now, right? We got to do something else. So six things that we have to do to recognize any rhythm or six step systematic approach. And I still do this now when I look at a rhythm, that's how I teach cardiology at school is these six identifiers you have to have to look at. Don't jump around and stay in order. Are there P waves? If there are P waves, are they upright and normal? Is there a QRS complex? Yes, I have to know these numbers by heart. 0.04 to 0.12, is that the length of the QRS? Conduction ratio, is there one P wave for every QRS and vice versa? What is a PR interval? From the beginning of the P wave to the R wave, how many boxes is it? And if it's 0.12 to 0.20, is it, if it's longer than 0.20, what do we start thinking is it is? A block, right? Everything's normal, it just has a prolonged PRI. What, what type of block? First degree, right? My cardiologist back there. First degree block. And then it has to be at the normal intrinsic, intrinsic rate of the SA node, 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now, if it drops lower, 50 to 40 to 50, and then 20 to 40, those are the intrinsic rates of the corresponding nodes that take over after the ones have failed. And then, when, uh, it, oh, sorry, uh, it, we look at the rhythm, 
do the P waves march out on a regular uh, basis and the, do the QRS complexes march out on a regular basis. And you could just do that, get a piece of paper, mark the lines and then march it out. Real simple, right? <clears throat> and then when we get to 12 leads, we'll look at the ST segment, the isoelectric line to, to figure out if it's an inverted T wave or a strain pattern. We'll go over that. We'll go over that. Uh, and the T waves, are they normal or are they inverted? We'll look at that. So when we look at our first rhythm, we look at our six, uh, six steps that we uh, try to identify a rhythm. P waves normal, QRS within that uh, 0.04 to 1, uh, 1, 2. One P wave for every QRS, vice versa. PRI is well within that 0.12 to 0.20. And it's a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 70, 75, right? Within, within that intrinsic rate of the SA node. And if I were to march out those R to R waves, these R waves are the top for your EMTs. The R wave is the very top of these squiggly lines. Um, that's how I know it works out regularly, normal sinus rhythm, right? Nice and easy. <clears throat> sinus bradycardia, same thing, P waves upright, uh, QRS complex, slightly prolonged, but nevertheless, I know it originates above the ventricles because of that P wave. Is now, even though that QRS is slightly prolonged, it's not grossly uh, ex uh, prolonged to the point where, oh yeah, that's ventricular in origin. <clears throat> Conduction ratio, one to one. Uh, the PRI slightly prolonged, and it's a rate of 30. So now you walk in, guy said, hey guys, how you doing? Come on in. You doing okay? Yeah, what's your name? Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, uh, what day is it today? Today's uh, Wednesday, I believe, right? What's wrong? I just don't feel good, man. I feel kind of weak. You put them on the monitor, feel for a pulse. I don't really feel anything. Put them on there. We see this. Treatment of choice. BLS before ALS, treatment of choice. You guys know it, don't be scared. Yes, oh no, wrong guy, yeah. Who said that? Yes, fluids first, right? BB gun before bazookas, right? All the time. Fluid challenge, before we do a fluid challenge, we listen to lung sounds, make sure we don't drown them, right? Give them 500 normal saline, get their pressure back up, it's not working, that didn't work, still don't feel good, next. Yes, uh, if you remember the pre-test, pre-test, AHA, what was the dosage? You remember, don't feel bad if you don't. One yes, one milligram per AHA. Why I bring, hey buddy, come on in. Why I, yeah, why I bring up uh, AHA and not our protocol is because when you get to the test, it goes by AHA and not Lee County protocol. Lee County protocol is 0.5 to max of? Three, right? Very good, very good. Yes, they went back to lidocaine, they increased the dosage on atropine. Yeah, they're using it now, uh, prophylactic for uh, pediatric intubation again. Yeah, mm -hmm. they came back and like, let's restudy this drug. And they actually found that some of the drugs we've been using for a long time don't think that they work as well as they used to. So I, I'm, I'm predicting in the next couple cycles, they'll totally get rid of it all. Just not like one or two drugs. Good. So now, same guy, you, uh, you pull up, wife's outside, frantic, waving on the phone. They're here, they're here. Please come inside. My husband's not doing good. Pale, cool, diaphoretic on the floor like this. Right, Anna? I don't feel good. I don't feel good. Treatment of choice? Pads. Put the pads on, right? What do we do before we give Edison medicine? Sedatum, be nice. I remember a uh, uh, brand new paramedic. This is when we had the Life Pack 5s and we had the paddles, right? I did two things bad. I forgot to put the gel. <laughs> yes. And I forgot to medicate him. So not only did I just fry him, ah! <laughs> I'm like, sir, I'm a trained professional. Please stop. <laughs> it's normal. What's that smell? Yeah, and he had the burn marks of the pads. My, my preceptor was like, new guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. Was that barbecue? <laughs> yes, yeah. So medicate them, be nice, right? Be nice. If you don't have time because they're so bad, oh well. Part of doing business, right? Just try to be nice. The good thing about Versed is we could give it nasally and it works fantastic. And uh, who's given it nasally before? 
How good does it work? Ridiculous, right? You're like, oh, already? Yeah, it's like that. And are you mixing it when you give it the I haven't. I haven't. Yes, you give it straight. It works fantastic. I had a status epilepticus uh, in my prior life. Could lady would just not stop seizing. Grandma seizure. There's no way I could start a line on her. No way. And I gave her the reset. Immediately. Straight five. Straight five. Like, like that. Seizure stopped immediately. Immediately. Yep. Out of Mockley. Yeah. Yep. Was chilling the whole way home or the whole way to the hospital. Yeah. All right. So now uh, we're going into our faster rhythms. P waves. Yeah, I can still see them. Conduction ratio, PRI, still good. My QRS complex is where it's supposed to be. Uh, my uh, rate is greater than 100, but it's still regular. Guy tells you I'm having some palpitations. Treatment of choice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Right? It's a fast rhythm. Is he stable or unstable? Stable. He's stable. He's telling you what's wrong. I just don't feel good. So we're at the fork of the road. Now we decided to go to the stable route. Fast rhythm. Treatment of choice. Yes. BB guns before bazookas, right? Vagal first. And what's the preferred method of vagaling? Bearing down. The syringe is a good one because a lot of people I've come into contact with where I've had to do that. On a sinus tack, bear down, make it slower, it's too fast. If, if they're saying they don't feel good, if they're starting to become hemodynamically unstable. Yeah, do you agree or what? I would think fluid challenge first, sinus tack. Absolutely, like, absolutely, man. Well, I would hit bagels until you hit an SVT, really. I mean, yes, but if they're telling you now, I feel short of breath and I have palpitations, now something's starting to happen, you can't let this guy feel like this. Fast. Yes. You can accomplish that in 15 seconds. While you're getting stuff ready. Right, we're getting stuff yeah. Ready. Yeah. But we can't let this guy just feel bad because it's the textbook doesn't say it's a, a an SVT. You're right though. I, I understand where you're you're thinking. I understand where you're thinking. But remember, he called us. There's a concern, palpitations, uh, uh, blood pressure starting to drop. He just doesn't feel good. He's still mentating. He's still stable. Right. But we need to do something. We need to do something. Fluid challenge first. Absolutely. But then let's try and slow that heart rate down. A lot of the time, too, remember, try to look at the patient and go, what is causing this patient? Yeah. Because What's the ideology? It could be the patient has a fever. Mm hmm. That could cause a fast rhythm. Yeah. The fever. So do we need to cool them down to get their heart rate? Yeah. Down? Yeah. So, look at the. Yeah. We got to be detectives, medical well, detectives. I just didn't. But we've seen people in high rhythms that are completely normal. I've had them completely normal. I had a lady uh, in Naples, a uh, rate of 140, 150. Just felt a little short of breath, a little. I opted not to do anything. By the time we got to the hospital, she was <laughs> pale, cool, diaphoretic. Ruh -ruh, I should have done something, right? Remember, we, we treat the patient not the monitor, right? But I know where you're thinking. I know where you're thinking. Yeah. Try faster, right? Now, SVTs, right? Uh, QRS complex, can't tell. P waves, are those P waves or T waves? I don't know. Uh, I know that it's fast, SVT. You walk in, guy tells you I'm having palpitations. I just can't breathe. I was watching TV. All of a sudden, this happened. Treatment of choice. So, yes, what's that called, by the way? Do you guys remember? Huh? What? Mammalian diving reflex. G pulled that one out. Yeah. It's called the mammalian diving reflex. Who, take it to the bank. Yeah, when, when we, when we did... When I used to work at the... Anyone ever seen that before, by the way, when they dip their face in ice water? When I worked at the hospital, they did it. It works phenomenal phenomenal something happens in those barrel receptors in the neck when they feel the cold water and that heart rate drops almost immediately it's crazy yeah it's called the mammalian diving reflex who cares right but now vagal down blowing the syringe nothing's happening next 
Six, Lafferty says just go to 12. Would, be, would, be, would we be wrong going straight to 12? Not if you can justify it, right? Um, and I'll tell you from personal experience, I haven't converted too many of these. I haven't converted. Is that like the general consensus with you guys? Yeah, I have horrible luck with the denosine, man. Yeah, I'm like, it, it, you'll see it slow down and right back up again. Yeah. I'm like, okay, what do I do now, right? So SVT, right? Now, same guy, pale, cool, diaphoretic, says, I feel good, right? Two word sentences, you put them on the monitor, it's so fast, you can't count it. Treatment of choice? Edison medicine? Synchronize. Synchronize, what's the very first thing we do with the monitor? Hit the synchronize button, right? Hit the synchronize button. You deliver the energy, right? Um, when you deliver the energy, do you just press the button? You got to hold it because the computer has to analyze those R to R waves until it delivers it. Delivers it, didn't work. We're going to give our second round. What do we do again? Synchronize. Always sync, sync, sync. Always sync, sync, sync. And hold the button. Hold the button. Protocol says 50 to 100 joules are the first time. Are you wrong starting off at 100? No. No. <clears throat> a flutter, we know it's a flutter. I've seen this once in my career, once in 27, 28 years, right? I know it's a flutter because of the characteristic saw teeth, all right? Looks like the teeth on a saw. And this is atrial flutter at a one, two, three, four to one conduction ratio. Um, the only time we treat this is if the patient starts to develop problems, right? Um, I would, I'd give ALS interventions, right? IVO2 monitor, uh, and he's got to go somewhere because if he tells you he has no history of heart problems, you put him on the, on the monitor, he has this, something's going on. You need blood work to find out what enzyme is released and causing these problems. AFib, uh, one of two rhythms that you can call irregularly irregular, super common. The majority of our patients and where we live have this rhythm, right? I know that because there's, it's AFib because there's no discernible P waves, right? Just a squiggly line. Uh, those atriums are just fluttering. And then when the ventricles want, they'll just beep every once in a while, right? Uh, treatment, of the guy tells you a uh, 52 year old male, no history, of any at all allergic to penicillin says he was watching TV. All of a sudden he started having palpitations and feeling weak. You put him on the monitor and he has this says it happened about this morning. It's now five o'clock in the afternoon. He's not feeling any better. New onset. Would you agree? No history of anything. Treatment of choice. Somebody said it. My man right here, Muha. Cardiazem. We don't carry it. EMS carries it. EMS carries it. It's, uh, it's in the protocol. It's an AHA. We don't carry it, but just know it's out there. Long term, what is the definitive treatment for AFib? Yeah. Yes. Or a form of it. Heavier duty aspirin. So to the W. Warfarin. Warfarin, right? And a pacemaker because now these ventricles beat sporadically. We could either put a demand pacemaker in or uh, a regular pacemaker in and blood thinners because those atriums are constantly fibrillating and blood stays in there for a while, doesn't eject out with that atrial kick. So it coagulates and then releases a clot. That's why they're on blood thinners. Junctional rhythm. We know that uh, inverted P waves, QRS complex is small, one, two, three, four. It's within that intrinsic rate of 40 to 50. It's regular, nothing going on, but treat the patient, not the monitor, right? Let's find out what's going on with this guy. We get into our blocks, first degree blocks. Unless the patient is suffering from something, I wanna get my, my panties in a bind on this one. The only thing that's going on here uh, uh, is that prolonged PRI interval, right? I still have P waves are upright and normal, one-to-one -one conduction ratio, vice versa. QRS is short, it's regular, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's at a rate of 70. 
uh, everything is normal except, except that prolonged PRI. First degree block, not a problem. Is not a problem. Still Do what? Is not in first degrees. Not in first degrees. Nothing I've read. It's in, contraindicated in all second degrees and type threes. So that's still going. Mm hmm. I haven't read anything. If you guys have, please let me know. I please. Was atropine educated in a first degree block? They normally say don't give atropine, but it's more for the, like, it's not the, the, third, the second or third. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen anything for the first degrees. First degrees, you really don't have, they normally leave them very untreated. Yeah. Oxygen. Um, they really only start really digging into them until they get to second and third. Yeah. Atropine is contraindicated. Yeah. Yeah. So we good on this, right? So then we get into our second degree blocks, our second degree type two or type one. You wink at me. I winky Bach. <laughs> 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 So how do we know it's a type one? Going, going, gone, right? P waves present, QRS normal, one-to-one -one conduction ratio, except for that thing I'm looking at right there, right? Uh, regularity, everything's cool. So the PRI interval is what I look at. Normal here, starts getting longer here, starts getting longer here, all of a sudden you have a P wave a non-conducted QRS, a compensatory pause, and then it starts all over again. Going, going, gone, starts over again. First degree type one, remember that, because it'll be in somewhere you later. Going, going, gone. Atropine will not work on this. Second degree type two. What's different from this one to a type one is that the PRI stays constant. If you remember one rule, remember this. Second degree type two, PRI stays constant. You just all of a sudden have a P wave, a non-conducted QRS, a small compensatory pause, and then starts back up again. That's the only difference, it's the only difference. We look at the patient, not the monitor, okay? And then third degree block, me and Blanco are playing the Djimbi, and he's playing one beat, I'm playing another. That's what's happening here. Two drums beating to a completely different beat. The, uh, the P waves are doing whatever they want and the QRSs are doing whatever they want. Third degree block. But not to each other, not to each other. So if I march out those P waves, they're doing their thing. If I march out the QRSs, they're doing their thing. They're not uh, uh, coinciding with each other. That's what I'm talking about. One thing's regular, one thing's regular, but they're not regular together. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that each QRS is a P wave. Like, this is a, this, you're right, no, no. On this one, yes. On this one, yes. So usually you can see like a P wave on a QRS. Normally, Sometimes, you, normally can. They're, they're yes. Sometimes you can, yes. Sometimes you can. Or they just don't line up. Unfortunately, yes, this strip is a little bit. I should get a better one. Should, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That one's going to throw you the wrong. Yes. It does look like, but not, normally the P wave does not match. Yeah, because like G said, you'll sometimes have a, the, a the P wave, wave inside the QRS and the QRS will look funky. Yeah. Um, so, okay, atropine doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. That looks like a two. It does. It does. Yeah, because it almost looks like that middle P wave is getting. Yeah. 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 I see what you're, you're saying right there. And I think another way to, to tell is, see how close this is, this, this P way to this? Normally on a type two, you wouldn't have it so close to the T. It would be, it would be regular, so it would be farther away. Mm -hmm. So that's another way. Yeah, I should get a different one. That makes it more worrying. All right, so uh, P waves, upright, normal. QRSs are uh, normal, except for that one I'm looking at there. Uh, conduction ratio one to one. I got a PVC with nothing going on. I know my first deflection is negative, second deflection is positive, but it's just one PVC, premature ventricular contraction. I know it, it originates in the ventricles because that QRS is wide. It's unifocal. The test calls it what? Do you guys remember? It starts with an M. Mono Monomorphic. That, I bring that up because you'll see that in the test. They don't call them unifocal, they call them monomorphic. They call them monomorphic, right? And the other one, multifocal, comes from two different parts in the ventricles because we see that this uh, ventricular contraction looks very much different from that one, right? First deflection is positive, negative. First deflection is negative, then positive, right? Multifocal, AHA calls it 
Polymorphic. 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 Very good. I, I stop and let you guys know about this because that's how they word it in the test, and I don't want you get, to be thrown off by that. Yump and Yemeni, ventricular by Gemini. I don't agree with by Gemini. I think it should be unigemini, right? <laughs> that's not a word, but whatever. By Gemini because every second beat is a ventricular beat, unifocal. That's the only thing why it's a by Gemini. Try Gemini, right? One, two, third beat. Every third beat is ventricular in origin. If every fourth beat were be ventricular, what would we call, call that? Starts with a Q. Quadrogemini. Quadrogemini. Very good. You guys are on it, man. Awesome. I've never seen it. Huh? You want your money? Here we go, bro. I'm all out. You know what, bro? I, I'm all out of 20s. You're going to have to have a hundo here. A C note. C note. Right there. Don't spend it all in one place. Yeah. Here you go, baby. <laughs> so we know this one, right? This one's easy. Wide complex QRS. You walk in the door, guy looks at you, waves you on, man, I, I just don't feel good, man. You check a pulse, it's fast. Is this guy stable or unstable? He looks at you, visual tracking says, come on in, what's your name? Mr. Johnson, is this guy stable or unstable? Stable. Visual tracking, come on in, he's giving you commands. Right, he tells you what's going on. I don't feel good. There's a palpations. I feel weak. You put them on the on the monitor, and you see this. What is your first treatment of choice? Edison medicine, or sorry, medicine, medicine. Right, which medicine? G's making out today, bro. G, G's paying attention. G and G Productions, homie. G. So amniodarone. Remember, we have a dead dose and a live dose. What is our live dose? In how much fluids? Yes. Yes. Right. So the live dose for this guy, because he's stable, is 150 milligrams amniodarone and 100 cc's normal saline or D5 over 10 minutes. And remember, 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 amniodarone is going to stay in that system for about 100 days. Yeah, IV intravenously and PO, 90 to 100 days. Sticks around for a long time, long time. Now, same guy, uh, you come in, wife is waiting outside. Pilical diaphragmatic, what's your name? Tuesday, stable or unstable? Unstable, all right, treatment of choice? Edison medicine, Edison medicine, right? How, what do we do? Synchronized cardio version, right? Yes. First thing we do is sync, right? 50 to 100, doesn't matter. 100, 50, no one's going to sue you if you do either or, right? Press and hold the, the, the uh, shock button. Does it again. This guy's not feeling better. We do it again. What's the first thing we do? Sync button. Always hit the sync button. And the Zoll guy's going to harp on that as well. Uh... Tesla medicine. He actually it first. That's right. That's actually that's actually correct. That is actually correct. Yep. Uh huh. Politically correct. It's all about being political now. We know this one, right? But what does Hollywood love to do to this rhythm? Clear, bing. It's like me shocking this mannequin. Is it going to come back to life? No matter how many times I shock it, right? But Hollywood, because it has a dramatic effect. Oh my God! He brought him back to life. You show squiggly lines. He's in V-fib. Public's going to go like, what? V-fib, what is that? But they'd, oh, that heart's dead. Shock it. Nyeh. Anyone ever shock asystole? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doesn't feel good. So asystole, we know this one. Treatment of choice? Epi. Epi and? Epi and? We used to pace. Epi and Epi and compressions. That's it. Epi till the cows come home. Super easy. This one's an easy one, right? So uh, eight, uh, get away from AHA. Let's think Lee County protocol. Our uh, dose for epinephrine is then, then, then yeah, 0.5. 
to the max of two. So they did studies and figured out that when we were just drowning and dosing these people with epinephrine, yes, it brought them back. But when it hit them systematically or systemically, their heart and their brains were caused, uh, I believe it caused vasoconstriction and stroked them out. So they weren't walking out or if they were, it wasn't a high quality of life. And that's one of the drugs that I believe eventually they'll get rid of. Yeah. One. Still one every three to five. One every three to five. No or max. no, no max. No. Or they're saying now, if I if you watch the video, uh, epinephrine on an so they say every three to five, or the average is four, which coincides with your rhythm check. Yeah. yeah if you look at the video, if you guys want to see the video, I'll put it on for you. But <laughs> it's pretty much everything I'm it's telling you. Better, but still yeah, still redundant. Yeah. We know this one, right? Shock till you find something you can do with. We know this one, right? Shock, CPR, shock, CPR, shock, CPR. Now, uh, amniodarone, dead dose. What's our dose? 300. 300. Bolus. Uh, with amniodarone, what do we have to be very, very careful of not doing? Shake it. I wish I had a vial with me. because Have you guys ever done it for kicks and giggles? It foams up, like the whole vial foams up, and it takes a while to subside. If you guys ever come across an expired one, next time you guys uh, find an expired one, shake it up once or twice. Oh, you do? Awesome, yeah. When you get to the codes over there, shake it up and you'll see it just foams up. You've seen it before. It's crazy, right? Yeah, you're like, whoa. <laughs> That's why they say don't do that, yeah. So our first dose of amniarone is 300. Our second dead dose is how? Fast or slow? Bolus, fast, very good. So, normal sinus rhythm, everything's cool, except, bro, I don't find a pulse. PEA, right? Um, now, in a sterile, what do we do with this? Who said that? Who said that? That down. Oh, boom, right here. Right here. Last, hun last hundo. Last hundo. Give this to your 18 year old. Last hundo right there, ultrasound, right? Because 50 to 54% of all PEAs in the field, even pre-hospital, they were finding out that were viable rhythms. They did studies on that. Uh, Mike just had one the other day. It was a PEA, she's gonna show you the video. It was PEA and you could very much see that heart circulating blood and pumping, but not enough to generate a pulse. 50 to 54% of all PEAs in the field still have viable hearts. It just needs a little help. But this is everybody. Yes. Okay. All right. 12 lead interpretation. What do the leads on the chest mean? Where am I looking at? V3, V4 is the anterior portion of the heart, which is usually the most common portion of the heart that infarts. I'm not going to say always. Two things I never say about medicine, always and never. You can never say always and never about medicine because just when you think, oh, the book said I'll never see this. Wait a minute. I just happened, right? So 2, 3, and AVF, uh, inferior portion shows right coronary system, right? Uh, what does AVF stand for? Augmented vector foot. Yeah. A, uh, yeah. Uh, so 1, AVL, uh, lateral portion, V1, 3, 2 is the septum. I still can't picture what that looks like, right? I need pictures. I'm a fireman. I'm not too bright. So we have this thing. This used to be in our protocol. I think it still might be in our protocol. It, that's where I got it from back in the day anyway. So the colors correspond to where the leads are placed, right? Inferior, lateral, uh, septal, anterior. I still can't place the heart, right? So I have this picture now. Perfect, right? I have a picture that correlates with the leads and tells me wh exactly what it is I'm looking at. 2, 3, and AVF is the at that anterior portion of the wall. Anterior septal right down there. V1, 2, 3, and 4. 1 AVL, 5, and 6 is my lateral wall, right? If you could remember this picture. This is what I think of when I look at a 12 lead. I kind of see this picture right here. So when we look at a 12 lead and an ST elevation, remember it has to, uh, for it to be an ST elevation, it has to be an elevation of one millimeter or higher in two contiguous lead, 
contiguous just means closely touching on all sides. And when we look at a normal PR, uh, PQRST complex, there is a portion here, a microsecond, right before the depolarization of the ventricles, that's what that T wave is. And when we look at an ST elevation, we see that they are closely bond and it's much elevated. Here's that isoelectric line and it comes well above it and then back down to that isoelectric line. If we look on this one here, normal QRST complex, that isoelectric line stays constant. That's how I know it's a normal non-ST elevation to where this one, it comes above that isoelectric line. I bring that up because when we get to 12 leads and reciprocal changes in T wave depression, we're gonna reference that isoelectric line as well. So what is the difference between a strain pattern and a true reciprocal change? <clears throat> Remember, to get a true STEMI, I have to have elevation in two, in two or more contiguous leads, one millimeter or higher with reciprocal changes in AVL, with reciprocal changes in AVL. So if I look at a strain pattern, right, I look at this T wave that's upside down, is that a T wave depression or that T, is that just inverted? What's going on here? How I tell is I follow my isoelectric line, it stays constant, <clears throat> barely, barely dips, and then it comes underneath there, that T wave, and then back to that isoelectric line. That isoelectric line stays constant on a strain pattern. That's non-ST depression. I come over here, AVL, there's my isoelectric line, and then it dips very much below that isoelectric line, causing that T wave depression. If I were to turn this upside down, it would look like an ST elevation, very, very similar to it, and then comes back up to that isoelectric line and it dips down below. So if we something, see something like this, this would be a true reciprocal change in AVL with those other factors we need to call a STEMI, we would call a STEMI. <clears throat> this is your heading at the top of your 12 lead, right? I'm t uh, using a life pack, by the way, not a Zoll. Do you have a question? No. Oh, okay. So using a life pack, this is the information that it tells us at the top. If you guys ever paid attention, right? It's you're doing a 12 lead. It gives you your rate, the time. It gives you my PR interval, my QRS complex time, my QT to QTC interval, my P QRST axis deviations. What I want to live is right here, QRS and T axis deviation, if you guys remember this, right? If it's 100 or below axis deviation, it's probably an MI if it meets all that other criteria. If it's 100 or above, it probably isn't. So 130 minus 30 is? 100, so it's at 100, so they're probably not having an MI, right? But remember, we treat the patient not what this says. But I want you to remember these numbers because when we get into these next readings, you'll understand why. <clears throat> so how do we determine the STEMI, right? We must show elevation in one millimeter or greater, must be in two or more contiguous leads, free of artifact, and you have to have reciprocal changes in AVL, augmented, augmented vector left. Who cares? So we look at our first 12 lead. Two, three, AVF. Isoelectric line stays constant everywhere. Would you guys agree? Yeah. It's constant here, constant dips down, but then comes back up. Totally constant. I see my short period for uh, depolarization of the ventricles. Do you guys see anything abnormal out of the ordinary here? Pretty normal, right? Pretty much a normal sinus rhythm. It's not a fantastic tracing, right? Because we're using the what we have, the, a 20 year old technology. But nevertheless, we can determine if there's any elevation or depression. Would you agree? Yeah, fairly clear. So we come to the next one. Uh, we look at, let me see, two, boom. Three, boom, reciprocal changes, isoelectric line, dips very much below that, so that's not a strain pattern, that's a true reciprocal change, right? Uh, isoelectric line, well below it, there's the isoelectric line. Would you uh, uh, agree that that's a depression, ST depression, right? Yes. 
Um, so everything's normal. Okay, so now we look at our axis deviation. Uh, 88 minus four, is that less or more than 100? Less than 100. So why do we not see acute MI suspected on here? What's going on? The guy complains of, uh, um, uh, uh, he's pale, cold, diaphoretic, clenching his chest, retrosternal chest pain, 10, radiating to the left arm, says the pain now is exactly as his heart attack two years ago. But acute MI is not, uh, not seen. Will EMS call this a STEMI? No. <laughs> no. But I have everything telling me it's a STEMI. Looks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Right, has feathers like a duck. Look at that. Access deviation is under 100. Elevation in two, three with reciprocal changes. Our monitor, one, two, right around there, isn't picking this up, right? Because of the type of monitor we use. Had this been a Zoll, it's more accurate, and we would see an acute MI suspected here. So don't let a reading like this say, oh, there's nothing going on with this guy. Because I have elevations, the monitor's not picking it up, but my brain is telling me I am because I have my axis deviation here, elevation 2, 3 AVF with reciprocal changes in AVL. Do you guys see what's going on there? Yes? Pretty good, right? <clears throat> okay, so we look at our next one. 2, 3, AVF. Isoelectric line stays constant. There's the isoelectric line, dips, and then back to the isoelectric line. Strain pattern or T-wave inversion? Strain pattern, right? Uh, axis deviation over or under 100? 100, 100. Remember, if it's under 100, it probably is. If it's 100 or over, it probably isn't, right? So this guy says, no, I feel fine. I just had a sinkable episode. If you're not doing a 12 lead on someone who had a sinkable episode, you're being negligent as a paramedic. Every sinkable episode must, must, must have a 12 lead because we don't know why they had that episode. So we have to dig further. Everyone who has a sinkable witness, sinkable episode, you should be doing a 12 lead. So. Uh, acute MI suspected, but wait a minute, access deviation is 100, no elevation anywhere, no ST depression. What is going on here? There's three times or three instances that the life pack will give you a false positive, and that's uh, if the patient has left ventricular hypertrophy, which they kind of have, and I know that because of my very long, sharp, touching QRS complexes and V4 through V6, right? If these things were like this long, right? Then for sure, for sure, they have left ventricular hypertrophy. That enlargement of the inner left ventricle, it's just tired of beating. It's not effective, right? It has to beat very much. That is one instance in which the machine will give you an acute MI suspected. The other instance is a right bundle branch block. Do you guys see a, any kind of a bundle branch block on here? No. The other time where the machine will tell you acute MI suspected when there isn't, if there's a paced rhythm. Paced rhythm, right bundle branch block, or left ventricular hypertrophy will give you a false positive. I look at this rhythm here and bing, 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 one right there. Those are pacer spikes hidden in those, in those complexes. It's a demand pacer. So because this is a paced rhythm, the computer is interpreting that as something it thinks of as an acute MI, and it's giving you a false reading. The guy had a singable episode, who knows why, right? Remember, we're lawnmower mechanics, our patients are jet engines, right? Think of it that way. So. If you see this sign, but nothing else is adding up, axis deviation 100 or over, no elevation anywhere. Look at the other symptoms, right? Absence of left ventricular hypertrophy, no bundle branch block, but I have pacer spikes. 
right? Okay, now let's start something else. I don't want to go cardiac so much or am I? Let's do some other questionings, okay? Just be aware of that. So we look at this next one here. Access deviation, 100 or under. Don't worry about the negative side. 100 or under or over. What's, uh, what's 68 minus 5? Is that under 100 or over 100? 100. Under 100, right? So a small light bulb going off. Small light bulb going off. Uh, some ventricular hypertrophy, right? The uh, really sharp, long QRS complexes, V1 through 5. No pacer spikes, no bundle branch block. Uh, do I see anything? Two, three, AVF. Uh, how about that isoelectric line? No depression there, right? No? What if I tell you this is a diabetic who called from left elbow pain? What do we know about diabetics? They are a pain in the ass, but they interpret pain much differently than we do because of how the nerves are damaged from uh, a high amount of glucose in the intravascular space and intracellular space. High glucose affects the nerves, a condition called neuropathy. It deadens the nerves. So diabetics feel pain differently than the rest of us normal people. They don't feel pain, right? So anytime a diabetic has pain, in this area here or above here for kicks and giggles just throw them on the monitor because they're interpreting pain much differently than you and i and i need to do some diagnostic tools to figure out what are we doing i was just watching tv and all of a sudden my just elbow started hurting it's never hurt before okay all right so i don't you don't really do anything for this guy take him says he wants to go to the hospital something's in your gut telling you let's just take him to the hospital right Taken him to the hospital, has 99% occlusion in his right coronary artery, the Widowmaker. Took him up to the cath lab. He had elevation in V1 and V3. Do you guys see anything? It's so minuscule, again, life pack won't pick it up. A Zoll would probably have. When we see the changes on here, and I should have put it out, is five minutes down the road, I do a repeat because this guy may be unstable. Then I would have seen that elevation to a three AVF with reciprocal changes. That's why it's so, so important to do repeat 12 leads every five minutes while you're on scene. If something in your gut tells you, let me just do a 12 lead on this guy, do a 12 lead every five minutes. It's not your EKG paper, right? It's not like you got to write extra reports for all the extra 12 leads you've written, right? So just do those extra uh, 12 leads and you would have figured out this guy would have had elevation, right? So you just give him O2, non-rebreather, give him some nitro, his pressure was a little elevated, you don't know why, but he took him up to the cath lab, he had a 99.9% .9 uh, blockage in the Widowmaker. Not good, I would have, no one would have saw that coming, but something in your gut says, let's take this guy, right? And that's why I show that slide. Any questions on anything? Okay, I'm quickly gonna start with the changes for the 2020, there is only a few that really affect us. Stand closer. Stay, oh, stand closer. I don't want to cover it. So we've talked in the past, post-arrest, the big thing was like the temperature and stuff like that. So your post-arrest, their big things are 10 breaths a minute, 92 to 98% for your O2 sad. Remember, it used to be 94 to 98, now it's 92 to 98 for your O2 sat post arrest. So these are after you get your people back, where do you want your numbers to be at? You want your CO2 to be at 35 to 45. We always say that maintain a blood pressure of 90, get a 12 lead as soon as you can. That's another big thing with ACLS. Um, target temperature management. So what they're saying is now, it used to be 32 to 30 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. Now they've added for a comatose patient. So of course, if your patient wakes up and they're mentating, you're not going to keep them at a cold temperature or a cooler temperature. So they've just added that line. Um, and not that it's changed, but just again, check your H's and T's. Uh, for pregnancy, this is more hospital-based, but we just wanted to bring it to your attention because there might be a test question on it. So kind of think of your H's and T's. 
that you have for cardiac arrest. This is for pregnant women. These are some things of why they might be in cardiac arrest. So obviously, you know, a lot of women, they get like epidurals and stuff like that. So that might have caused them to go into cardiac arrest. Bleeding, okay, do they have, did their placenta abrupt or anything like that? Obviously, if they have heart problems, cardiovascular, drugs, clots, fevers, um, just the regular H's and T's, and hypertension. So they have added this. But again, this is more hospital-based of things that would cause a pregnant woman to go into cardiac arrest. One of the changes in the algorithms was, is now witness, unwitness. You know how we used to do the whole, oh, do so two minutes of CPR, then you're going to go to your epi. Now it's get epi on board as soon as possible. Okay. I think realistically, all of us in the field, we'd go in there, we start CPR as soon as we got a line, we were pushing the epi. We really weren't. If you really think about it, by the time you start CPR and get a line, it's probably been almost two minutes. So it really kind of worked out. But now their algorithm is epi as soon as possible. Um, they just reiterated this, that they've done studies and double sequential pacing or double sequential defibrillating is not recommended. What is recommended if we have a VFib patient that we shock like, let's say three or four times and they're not converting? Pad placement. Pad placement. So switch your pad placement, go, go front and back, okay? Um, as we've already said, and we'll say it again, atropine dose for beta cardia has increased to one. Again, our current protocol still reads the old ACLS, which is 0.5. Lee County normally follows ACLS, so that might change when they do a protocol update. Honestly, 0.51, you're not really going to get dinged one way or another. Lafferty's not going to come and go, why did you give point? You know, Lafferty normally likes to give more meds than less, so. Uh, ACLS is now stating IV access is preferred over IO. So they actually recommend that you try to start an IV before you go to an IO. I do not know what our stance will be on this in the future. Um, some people yesterday kind of questioned, you know, well, why is an IO like preferred and good and works and stuff? I can't give you a direct answer, but I think a lot of it has to do with improper IO placement. Um, did anybody from this, from your shift go to the recent IO class? I know A-Shift had a few guys, um, and I think it was like Zembel, Lanton, Rambo, they said, phenomenal class. If you guys, Coulter sends it out every once in a while, especially if it's like closer. The one with the cadavers? Yeah, the phenomenal class, if you ever get to go. Um, one thing they were taught was always use the yellow needle, no matter where you're going. Even yeah. That's the manufacturer recommendation. That's not protocol. <laughs> but if you look at an IO needle, there's two black lines on it. That is where it should be at the skin level. This burying it in, you're going too deep. You're going too far and it's not in that part of the bone where it's the fluids are going into the body. So you're supposed to go in, touch it. As soon as you feel it go into the bone, let go. If that colored hub is touching the skin, now, yes, on a heavier set patient, it probably will be. But on a regular person, you should still be seeing some of that needle sticking out. Um, I know personally, I've seen EMS where literally they started an IO and I turned and looked and the IO was sitting like this at a 90 coming out of the shoulder. I was like, what? that is not the right placement. So I'm not sure if that's the reasoning why. I'm sure there'll be more to come about that, but their stance is the IVs work better. So attempt an IV first. Again, ACLS, not protocol. Care and support during recovery. Uh, again, hospital-based, but the big thing that they're talking about now is don't just put these people in the ICU, put them on the floor, send them home. They're really talking about getting like a true team together. If anybody has been in a hospital and seen like the ICUs and how the ICUs work, on a daily basis, the whole team comes in and talks about the patient. And that's from the doctors to the nurses, to the dietitians, to the you know, physical therapy. They literally have pharmacy. Everybody's in there working together to treat this patient. So that's something that they're talking about is working as a team to make sure this patient can neurologically come out and make it out of the hospital. Not just, oh, okay, yep, all right, your heart's beating again. All right, you can go home. Um, they also talked about um, mental awareness for the family and the patient. For us on scene, you know, comforting the family. 
and also just working with the survivor of the actual patient because that is a traumatic experience for themselves. They have just died and now come back and a lot of them have anxiety and depression and stress from that. So again, that's more hospital based, but ACLS is talking about that, which also goes into debriefing us. So we got on a whole tangent yesterday about CISM and peer support and this and that. And we don't need to get into that right now, but pretty much just that we really need to work on taking care of ourselves. And most of us in here have run so many cardiac arrests and it's, you know, we don't even think about it. It doesn't affect us. But all I can say is just remember if you have a new person on your truck or you have that probe that this is their first cardiac arrest. You could probably, I could probably go around the room and each one of you can probably tell me about your very first cardiac arrest. You will remember that one forever. So just remember to keep an eye out on your new guys or each other. I always say too, if you, you might have something going on at home that is going to affect you now at work, that that call would have normally not affected you, but something at home is now triggering things. So just keep an eye on each other. All right. Drugs. All right. So these are all the ACLS drugs that are mentioned in ACLS. Um, the ones that have asterisks are ones that we carry. Yes, I still asterisk cardizem because EMS carries it. Um, I don't think this ended up being in the test, thank goodness, but this is a new one that they've added. It's just another beta blocker for SVT. I know Fred has touched on some of them. So adenocard, denosine, what's our dose? Okay, and if we want to repeat it, what if we get some guy that goes, oh yeah, I'm in SVT all the time, they always have to give me a dental card. Just go straight to 12, okay? Um, amiodarone. So amiodarone, live dose, dead dose, right? So dead dose, they get pushes. Live dose, they get drips, okay? Um, what if you get somebody that was in a V-fib, you shock them and they convert? <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't push, we didn't push amio. We just, we happened to shock them once they came out. Drip. 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 They are now alive. No more of that, oh, push and then a drip. It is, they are alive, they get a drip. Okay, so 150, 100 over 10 minutes. Aspirin, ACLS does touch on STEMIs and strokes still. So we all know our STEMIs. Um, big thing, we just had one. They, you know, chest pain. Oh, I took my own aspirin and nitro. Oh, can I see your bottle of aspirin? Okay, well, it was non-chewable and the bottle looked so old, I turned the back and it expired in 2018. I was like, I said, can I see your nitro bottle? Give me the nitro bottle. Expired in 2017. We redosed them on everything. So make sure you're looking at their bottles to make sure they're actually taking the appropriate med if they did take it before you get there. Atropine. Remember, this is the one that changed. ACLS is now one milligram for bradycardia. Our protocol is still 0.5, okay? It will not work on third degree blocks. We do not give it for second or third degree, but they contraindicate it for third. Cardizem, more for your AFibs and A-flutters. So again, let's say we have somebody that is just an SVT. Has anybody like scratched off like engine and wrote squat on it yet? Oh, yeah. You did a push up yesterday? <laughs> like, gotta, you got to start somewhere. One, do one a day and then two and then three. Um, I'm just going to keep going so we can get this over with. Cardizem, so remember you have an SVT, you put them on the monitor, okay, we start with a denicard, you give a denicard and it slows it down and then you sit there and go, oh, that's irregular. All right, then we want to go to cardizem because of course a denicard is not going to work. So cardizem, so it's the 0.25, but it's a drip now. If you guys notice in the protocol, they actually change it. Again, e EMS carries it, so they'll do it, but it's not a push anymore. They put it in a bag and they actually give it through a drip. D10, remember when you're going through your H's and T's, don't forget about this, or you get somebody, you know, post-cardiac arrest, check 
glucose if you need to. You can give D10. Epi. Number one drug pretty much used in ACLS. You give it for everything, right? Um, our dose is 0.5 every five minutes for a max of two. ACLS, one milligram every three to five minutes. So again, on the test, you'll see that. What's the first drug? Epi, one milligram. Lidocaine came back. So you will see this on the test. I'm going to tell you that. So if it says, okay, you have a patient in VFib and you give epi, what is the second drug of choice? And there's no amio? Lidocaine, okay? Mag sulfate, we still have it in our protocol for chassades, um, one to two grams in 100 over 10 minutes. So I don't think, has anybody given it? Has anybody seen chassades, anything, anything? Yeah. Yeah. They, you guys just had one, right? Like it was probably about a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, that's another story. Uh, uh, real quick on Narcan. <laughs> there he is. Oh yeah, it was you too. Yeah. <laughs> Heard about that. Um, Narcan is an ACLS because, of course, you know what happens? They overdose and eventually they stop breathing and eventually their heart stops. Okay. Um, big thing that's being pushed out right now, um, we have our Narcan leave behind kits. I talked to the state the other day and she's like, how many, you know, Narcans do you leave in your kit? And I said two. And she goes, you probably want to up that. She goes, we're finding people that are needing to take eight plus milligrams of Narcan to reverse. I will tell you, station 41, we have some areas. We just had one that we ended up pushing six milligrams on to get him to start breathing. <laughs> no. No. The girlfriend gave him four up the nose before we got there because she had one of the kits that she'd actually gotten from Cape Coral. Um, we quickly gave him another, I think, one up the nose. Or two, we gave him two up the nose, didn't touch him, started a line, gave him one IV, and he finally woke up. And it was still not, and he was still not like, Awake, awake, but he was, he was breathing in a, yeah. so those kits, it's a four milligram and a four milligram nasal. So it's two nasals, four. So we tell them to give one and we tell them to wait. And if they need to, they can give the other one. If, if they've taken methadone, methadone has a five day half life. It is super strong. If there's a true methadone overdose, we have, you have to start a uh, Narcan drip basically. We don't carry enough uh, Narcan on our rigs to counteract a methadone overdose. So ask if they tell you, you know, they always deny it. Yeah. Did they take methadone? Yes. Okay, now we got to really keep an eye on this guy. But, but this but this new fentanyl and this new car fentanyl, it is so strong. Car fentanyl is for elephants. Yeah. So, and there were really seeing a lot. So. I will tell you, Bev on our shift used to fight me because like when they changed this, you know, we'd still want to give the like one or two milligrams. And she's like, no, no, we got to give half. We got to give half. I'm oh, like, yeah. <laughs> so she showed up on this one and we ended up giving so much and she didn't argue when we were giving more. And she even said, she goes, man, she goes, she goes, this wasn't bad. She goes, my last one, we, had, we gave over 10 milligrams before he woke up. <laughs> so I'm just saying this, I, I'm going to push for the county that we change this and go back yeah huh discretion. or discretion hey hey do you know what they took if they say fentanyl i'm like i'm gonna give a lot more right. yeah you know we can't kill them with narcan so you know and and it's listen i understand the whole like oh we we don't want them coming out of it angrily and blah 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 blah. but i'm like it no, no, no. So those kits, so no, no. Those kits are strictly to hand out after the call. No, I would use ours. What's that dose? Is it five? Uh, four. Yeah. No, I would, I would use ours because you don't know. You, EMS. We actually have four. We have two, you have two, two milligrams and plus EMS has more. No, yeah. So we have four on our truck. We have four total of four milligrams on our truck. Yeah. And then EMS has. 
I think they carry like four to six. But you got eight in the kit. No, uh, yeah, yeah. Listen, if they're not coming up with that, just, I mean, just get them in the truck and take them to the hospital, whatever. And just keep bagging them. So, um, but just be aware, it's taking harder to, yeah, don't you, yeah, I would not use that because I don't, who knows if they got them from us or got them from somewhere else, who knows if they're not expired, I just. Oh, you mean like the kits in the truck, like actually taking them out? No, I would just use our, just, yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll ask and find out, but realistically then just maintain their airway and get them to the hospital. And again, we have D31, just take them over there, done. So, uh, nitroglycerin for your STEMIs, 0.5 every three to five minutes. Um, let's say you got somebody patient complaining of chest pain, they start at a 10, you give them, you're giving them nitro, you're giving them nitro, you're giving them nitro, you get them all the way down to a pain of two. Do we still give nitro? Nobody, nobody? I got like painless. You have a STEMI, or not a STEMI, just a chest pain, could be a STEMI. They have a pain of 10. You're giving them nitro, a few minutes you give them nitro, you get their pain down to two. Do we continue to give them nitro? What's the blood pressure? Yeah, blood pressure is stable. Yes. Then yes, until they tell you pain is gone. It's a one. Nope. Pain needs to be gone. As long as their blood pressure is maintaining. Okay. What do you say on pain scale of one to ten? I do zero to ten. <laughs> I hate when people say one to ten. <laughs> zero to ten. Zero being no pain. <laughs> so. I don't know. Sodium bicarb. Um, tricyclic, uh, you know, overdoses, but you still get some old school medics that think, oh, if the person's been down long enough, I don't think anybody's been given it though. The only reason it's still on our truck is, oh, you did? When did you give it? I give it all. You do give it? Okay. Well, I, listen, I don't think it's going to hurt the patient, so it does. It absolutely does. To me, it doesn't hurt. You're not going to hurt the patient. <laughs> And then all of a sudden they kind of stop doing it. I don't, I know. I, and, but you'll still find your old school medics. Same thing with like Trendelenburg. You know, Trendelenburg's out of the protocol. Has anybody put a patient in Trendelenburg and you had somebody from EMS go, what are you doing? The old school will do it. The new guys won't. Who are you looking for? Oh. Side note real quick. If you guys ever have bad indigestion, if you withdraw in a syringe and shoot it in your mouth, it works. I do it all the time. <laughs> Walking in the office the other day, he's got a bottle of it sitting there. I was like, what are you doing? Well, that's what I was like wondering why I was on the lieutenant's test. And he's like, oh, I had heartburn. I was like. <laughs> oh, really? He, McDougal would know that. <laughs> it, it, pH levels, pretty much, yeah. So, I know, that doesn't surprise me. All right, real quick, we're just going to go through the algorithms. Some of them have changed, some of them have not changed. Um, I know a few people yesterday were like, I hate algorithms. I wish it was just boom, 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 straightforward. Um, that one's kind of pointless. All right, so this is your basic one. Talks about biphasic, monophasic, what your monitor is. Again, most of your drugs are going to be epi and then amio or lidocaine. Um, don't forget about your H's and T's. What are we going to do and what are we going to try to get when we get ROSC? Um, what happens if you have an end title that all of a sudden shoots up? Oh, check pulse. Check pulse, okay? Uh, you should, while you're doing CPR, have an end title of at least 10. If you have under 10, something is not right. Either your CPR is not right, your tube's not right, you're not bagging right. If you're doing good CPR, your end title should be at least 10, okay? And then if you get somebody back, it's going to shoot up. All right, so this is that change. So before, it would say two minutes of CPR. Now, as you see, it says epi as soon as possible, okay? So that was the biggest change. Um, so this is like your basic, like, okay, shockable, non-shockable. I'm just putting this up there again for um, pregnant women. Don't forget, baby's putting pressure on the aorta. We need to, Ravina Kiva, you need to, left side, right? Get the baby off of it. Um, who was it? I think Dean yesterday was like, this is really scary. 
And I was like, yeah. yes. So this line right here says, if no ROSC by four minutes of resuscitation efforts, consider performing immediate emergency cesarean section. It is in our protocol. It is still in our protocol, people. So real quick, you have a pregnant person, OK? Uh, traumatic arrest, OK? Let's think about it this way. Earlier, Fr Fred said, when you're doing CPR, you've got Somebody awesome, first time, okay, doing CPR. How much blood is getting circulated? About 30, 35%, right? At best. Now you have a pregnant woman that you are pumping. Let's say you're getting 35%, okay? Now that also has to go to a placenta to a baby. Okay? So again, it's not gonna be viable. So your chances are better if mom is DOA, so most likely like a traumatic injury or something like that, a car wreck. Is it going to hurt to attempt to try to get that baby out? No, because mom, mom is mom. dead. Okay, so consider potential removing the baby. Super easy Dean it. said, how the hell do you do that? Hip, hip to hip, okay? And you just start taking the scalpel and slowly, just one layer at a time, and you will see that sack. And, and then the next thing, because so, I always said, does, ha, raise your hand if you've ha, seen a C-section done. Okay, so it's, yeah, so just slice, 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 you get the sack open. What I would recommend, though, is somebody else come over here and kind of push. Who was it yesterday? Somebody was like, like popping a pimple, like popping a pimple, I guess. Push, because you're going to actually push that baby out, okay? No, no, if you've seen it, I mean, they literally, like, get the head, and then they're like this, and they, like, go, oh, okay, and then they... They try to make the really small. They do. If she's dead, and that's what, why he said, yeah. hip to hip, who cares? My incision is this big, this big, that's it. And again, they stretch, I mean, you can stretch the skin. She is dead, you are not gonna hurt her. Um, the updated uh, pregnancy one in hospital is, again, looking at your A through H, okay? Again, they put in hospital, so. Um, which one is this? Okay, post cardiac arrest. This is the big thing right here, your post management of breathe for them at least 10 times a minute. Our O2 stat is 92 to 98 and maintain a 35 to 45 end title. And then blood pressure at least 90. And then if they are in a coma, the hospital should be looking at temperature control. We're not really gonna worry about temperature control. Just know it for the test, because it is in the test. Pit crew, who likes pit crew? Raise your hand if you like pit crew. I know nobody likes pit crew. The only thing I really like about this is the whole send the first person in. Send somebody in there to find the patient, figure out what's going on and start CPR. Um, so that's a big thing. Um, whoever's at the head, I normally say you're the airway person, CPR, and then I normally let EMS stay with their monitor, right? Hopefully after today, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable with the Zoll, but that's their monitor, let them be on it. If they're not there, one person in charge of the monitor. Okay, Brady, we've beat it in your head. One milligram, right? Um, you can consider pacing. Try to find your un underlying causes for the Brady and the uh, tachycardias. Tachycardias, you have your stable and unstable, so we're either gonna go for adenosine or you're gonna go synchronized cardioversion. Chest pain, everybody know what to do with chest pain? Yes. Nitro, aspirin. Morphine? The old, Mona. old Mona. So, okay. Remember, treat the patient, not the monitor. If you don't see elevation, it doesn't matter. Do the meds, transport them to a cardiac facility. All right, last little section. Pacing. So how do we pace? Hit pacer on our monitor, right? Okay. You'll start seeing those little spikes. You're going to rate of what? 80. Slowly increase your inhaling amps till you see electrical capture, and then make sure you have mechanical capture. What if you have electrical but no mechanical? Keep going. Do we drop it 10% after we get it? No. no. When you get it, leave it. Yes. Can you give ketamine to the patient? Yes. If they're super, super unstable, you know, just get it going, and then you can give them ketamine. Yes. But if you've ever paced somebody that's alive, it's ow, ow, ow. It's not fun. Suck it up. Suck it up. 
cardio version, okay? <sighs> we have all these things. 50, 100, 150, 200, just work your way up, okay? You're not gonna get dinged if it was wide, ir you know, irregular, things like that. Biggest thing with cardio version, what do we have to do? Sink. sink. So you hit the sink, charge it up, and then you go shock and hold until that shock is delivered. If you just hit it, it will not deliver the shock. Okay, so we gave the first set, okay? Didn't work. So we're gonna up the jewels. What do I do first? Sink. Hit sink again, because after you shocked him, the sink went off. You have to hit sink again. Just remember that. Again, if you wanna be nice, you can give ketamine, but if they're really unstable, no, I'm just gonna defib them. Or cardio with them. Defib, all right, so we have biphasic monitors, so our monitor goes to 3, 360. If you have a monophasic, it's 360 continuous. When Zul comes in today, theirs is a little different. They, he will go over how, he, the, how it works, but pretty much his, their jewel settings are lower. But how it gives, and he, he gives a great analogy, I'll let him explain it. It's pretty much giving the two, three, 360. It just works a little bit differently, okay? Um, okay, real quick. I've got like two more slides and we're done. This is just for the test. So again, I'm just gonna reiterate. Temperature, 32 to 36 for 24 hours, right? Rapid response team is to help identify deteriorating patients. So yes, you will see that. So it's not, it's not, oh, somebody coded in the hospital and we're calling the code blue team. This is the rapid response team. So this is somebody that's circling the drain that we don't want to code. So we call them in, again, hospital-based. Initial check for unresponsive patient to check breathing and pulse, okay? Pulse check should be between five and 10 seconds. Um, Excessive ventilation decreases cardiac output. That was a big one that everybody kept asking yesterday. Excessive ventilation decreases cardiac output. For your STEMIs, door to balloon time, they want less than 90 minutes. You'll see that. You will see that on the test. Okay, uh, best test for a possible stroke is a non-contrast CT. Non-contrast CT. Uh, again, the temperature, you want it for at least 24 hours. Um, conscious patient with an O2 sat of 84, what's the first thing we're going to do? Oxygen, not BVM, oxygen, okay? Rate of compressions, we all know, 100 to 120, that gets beat into you. Best way to confirm two placement is capnography, okay? So signs that somebody is in cardiac arrest is agonal gasps. Really? And agonal gas is when they take that breath every, like, 30 seconds. It's your body's natural response. They are not breathing. But the problem is a lot of people used to think that that, oh, oh, they took a breath. They're alive. They're just not breathing well. No, no, it's a brain simulation. So it's not, it, they are truly in cardiac arrest. So they're, they're saying that if you see somebody with an agonal gas, so really like maybe breathing three times a minute, they're considered in cardiac arrest. I know. Always, 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 we want to maintain a blood pressure of 90. And remember, epi dose for ACLS is one milligrams every three to five, not our 0.5. Don't get confused. Any questions? Go to lunch.